All right. This is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt. Chapter 32, Section 5, Technological and Environmental Change. So technology is increasing at about the same rate as the population, and that is it is exponentially growing. Uh, World War II was a catalyst for a lot of new technologies, plus the Cold War. You know, you can think of things like the space race, in which both the United States uh, and the Soviet Union, um, you know, competed for which system could produce the more advanced technology. So a lot of this was coming from the government, but a lot of this technology has spread to the consumer world and had a profound impact on the economy. So from 1975 to the year 2000, there's been significant change in computing technology, and that's probably the most important technology there. We might also add cell phones because of the ability um, to connect people from long distances. We might also add the internet as one of these uh, more important technologies. But all of these things, computers, cell phones, smartphones, this has all led to substantial economic growth. Um, simply the ability for businesses to be much more efficient than they were in, in the past, whether that is communicating over long distances or um, whether that is, uh, you know, the power that computing programs have over just, you know, people trying to figure out, uh, you know, whatever it is, accounting or inventory or whatever else it may be. Also following the Cold War, global competition has increased, generally speaking, after the Cold War. There's been more global free trade. Oops. Yeah, really can't get this right. Erase it. More global free trade. Right, countries like Eastern Europe, like the Soviet Union, are no longer closed off to outside economies after the Cold War. China, which we learned about, still communist politically, but opened up to foreign investment. A lot of other previously communist nations are opening up to foreign investment. So generally speaking, there's a lot more free trade and a lot more competition. And so that what that means especially is that for the industrial nations or the developed nations, they need more efficient technology to compete with low labor costs, right? So for example, robotics, uh, especially when it comes to manufacturing, you know, really was, you know, really started in Japan and gave Japan like the leg up in the 1980s and 1990s, but has since spread to places like China which China is an area which benefits both from robotics and from low labor costs. And that's why a lot of things are produced or manufactured in China, as long as global trade remains free. So in a sense, more competition led to the desire to create more efficient technologies, you know, plus when you have things like computing, which makes robotics possible. Now there are essentially robots that can make cars and all sorts of other things, TVs and whatever else it may be. Also in this era of more global free trade has, has really coincided with the rise of the transnational corporation, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, Honda, uh, Nestle. A transnational corporation is a corporation, really, it's like a corporation not located in any country. but kind of present in all. So for example, Coca-Cola is an American company, but Coca-Cola does so much business around the world, whether that is manufacturing, whether that is acquiring the resources, the plastics, the aluminum, uh, you know, whatever product goes into the secret recipe of Coca-Cola. I mean, they might have production facilities in you know, uh, 20 different countries, and they sell their product in 200 different countries. And so even though we think of Coca-Cola maybe as an American company, the reality is, is that some of these corporations and businesses 
really kind of supersede national boundaries. And that's what we refer to as um, uh, national or transnational corporations. They're kind of bigger than the countries they were created in. And what makes this possible is, again, this point about there being more parts of the world open up to um, economic trade. Treaties like NAFTA. NAFTA is a free trade agreement. Stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. It allows for free trade between Canada, US, and Mexico. And what that allows for is that these nations can openly trade with each other without having to pay taxes. And so what this does, especially for the United States, is that a lot of the factories and manufacturing facilities in the US that were there during World War II, because the cost of labor in the United States is higher, most of them end up moving to Mexico. And so Mexico at least benefits in the uh, short term from having factories move there. Uh, again, low cost of labor, things can get cheaper. And then, of course, the benefit that both the United States and Canada gets is they get cheaper goods, right? So an automobile made in the U.S. might cost, you know, $30,000, whereas in Mexico, when those factories are built there, only cost $2,000. So it's, um, again, this is something, this is a trend that's certainly been occurring since the falling of the Soviet Union. And um, only up until, I would say, maybe recent times has gotten a little bit of pushback of some of the consequences and effects that it may uh, that it may have. This is something that's been happening in the United States from earlier than that, you know, really all the way to the 1970s and 1980s, but really on a, a truly global scale, the falling of the Soviet Union, and we'll actually, we'll, we'll mark these things. Uh, this will be good, right? The fall of the Soviet Union and to China's, write that properly. China's uh, economic, and again, this means um, uh, opening up to foreign investment, that those two have really allowed for a lot more global trade, a more free global trade. And by free, we mean tax-free, or at least low taxes, uh, more so than any, any time in the, uh, in the past. Now, while our world is becoming more technologically advanced, uh, more wealthy, generally speaking, uh, at the same time, growing uh, growing division between the rich and the poor um, is also putting an enormous amount of stress on the environment and perhaps more stress on the environment than uh, than we've ever had. Uh, two factors in the in this kind of 1975 to 19 or sorry to 2000 era, the post World War II economy boom, right, especially the growth in consumption. Uh, first in the United States, Western Europe, and then in places like China. Uh, added with the population booth, we talked about this last chapter, between 1950 and the year 2000, global population has doubled. This has put a lot of stress on resources. So I'm going to say stress on resources. Now, for industrial nations, a lot of the environmental damage has kind of already been done. So for the most part, when you look at a nation like the United States, uh, the United States is passing or has passed um, you know, environmental legislation, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, for the most part in developed nations like the United States, um, you know, things like smog are declining, right? Generally speaking, there has been environmental progress. Nations like China, which are, you know, on their way to developing and becoming industrial, you know, they're still in some ways is environment uh, declining, right? And in places that are newly industrial, like uh, India and Brazil, the environment is declining, but declining a lot more rapidly. And so when we look at the entire globe, you know, the areas of the world today that are putting the most stress on the environment are your Chinas, are your Brazils, and are your Indias, whereas your industrial or developed nations like the United States, Western Europe, the damage kind of has already been done. And so this brings up a very difficult question, and that is, you know, should these other nations like China, India, and Brazil, should they have to sacrifice their economic development for the sake of the environment when nations like the United States and Great Britain and France 
and others have kind of already done the damage that they did and have reaped some of the benefits from it. So when we look especially at developing nations, you know, we might say that there is the most stress on the environment from developing nations. Here's a good example, deforestation, places like Brazil, right? And, um, you know, there have been efforts internationally. Uh, I'll just talk about this map real quick. This map demonstrates or shows uh, the most stress on water supplies, the red, meaning that there is uh, high stress on water supplies. And you could see, you know, places like China, places like India, especially the more dry parts of the Middle East, there tends to be a lot more stress on some of the water supplies. Uh, the southwestern United States, right, that's a good example there as well. But there have been some international efforts to curb um, environmental problems. The meeting in Kyoto, Japan, sometimes called the Kyoto Protocols, was an international effort to address uh, greenhouse gas. So that is, you know, what was destroying the ozone layer, or I think, no, maybe it wasn't the ozone. Um, but greenhouse gases, which uh, contribute to things like global warming. But even at Kyoto, Japan, uh, you know, at the Kyoto Protocols, China was exempt from them, and the U.S. Uh, did not join. And so this continues to be a an area for global cooperation. In fact, the United Nations, which was created post-World War II as a peacekeeping organization, has taken on, in some cases, the cause of the environment, which is somewhat interesting to note, considering the purpose of the UN was to you know, maintain peace and prevent war, but now has kind of assumed this other responsibility in some ways.